Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel, co-host of Escape from the City on the ABC and partner of Empower Wealth Advisory. Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of Empower Wealth Advisory, named the 2018 and 2019 Property Advisory Firm of the Year. Stay tuned as they bring you the Insider's Guide to Property, Finance and Money Management. All right, folks, welcome back to the Property Couch podcast and welcome back to you too, Ben. How are you, mate? G'day, mate. How are you going? I'm good. I'm really good. You had a good week? Uh, yeah, I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in ISO, mate. Oh, you're in um, ISO? You're, yeah, uh... I'm in ISO. Um, yeah. We had, Harry had a friend come over and stay on Saturday night and... Um, he, did, he didn't feel too well. In other words, his friend didn't feel too well on Saturday, Sunday morning. And so he had a rats test and had a faint second line, got a PCR test and confirmed it. Confirmed positive. And so because he spent four hours with us under the laws and rules here, we have to spend the next seven days in ISO. ISO. All right. How do you so we're about all that? still negative, which is nice, but um, wait and see, Bryce. We might, I might be inside for a while. You might be inside for a while. That, I can see that going well for you because you love being. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I love, I love, I love staying in four walls. Yep, that's that's me. I'm I'm an outdoors man, like living indoors. So no, anyway. But other than that, no complaints. You know, we've got our health. Well, I've had COVID too, Ben. So you know that, and my wife Andrew's had it. So um, and to be honest, um, there's some people who did it way worse than us because uh, totally. When, when I got it, uh, Ben, it uh, just flicked over from 14 days ISO to seven mm. and my gosh <laughs> that was, that so, was well I'm hoping I'm, I'm hearing stories right where unfortunately there's families of you know sizes of ours who are still in their third week because it's just slowly progressed Rolling through, through yeah. the family so yeah. hopefully that won't be the case but I did read something uh, in the paper earlier this week Bryce it was talking about um, maybe if you are asymptomatic Mm-hmm. You uh, you may not have to um, ISO, so hopefully we'll yeah. hear more about that um, before our second week, yeah, <laughs> if yeah. one of us does come down with it. But uh, yes, yeah, although it's obviously still a serious matter for a it lot of people, hmm. so um, yeah, hopefully um, hopefully we stay negative and and keep safe. Yeah, I hope you do too, mate. Yeah, I hope you do too. The um, uh, today uh, we have got um, it's exciting today. We're talking about Q and A day, which you know we love. There's a little twist yep. which we'll talk about shortly. But um, before we get there, mate, uh, just community service announcement, a podcast community service announcement from you regarding PFM. What is that, please? Yeah, so the the guided money smart setup information session that we've run, we've had an enormous response. So thank you for those people. So we've just closed that off. You can still go to the to the web page if you want to um, wait list for a future event, but we've had um, a couple of hundred people basically reach out. So we've got enough numbers to to talk to them about um, what we can do to help them and hold their hand in setting them up with what we think is the best money management system on the planet. Mm-hmm. So we're going to be stepping through that with uh, those people to see whether we can help them. Um, but yeah, so if you can still go to the website, um, register your interest for the next time around and we'll let the community know when that is. So, um, you know, it's just if people stumble across it later on, um, the page details have changed. So we just want to give that little community announcement out there. And Ben, for those folks who just heard that and they thought, oh, I've only just caught up. I'm two or three weeks behind on the podcast and, oh, I missed out. So that's what you're saying. You can still go there, register, um, leave your details. And when the second intake comes through, um, you'll be able to reach out and let them know. So folks, we'll cover everyone at the moment. The house is full, but not for always going forward. So there's an opportunity there. Just so for the URL for that, Ben, uh, you go to thepropertycout.com.au forward slash money smarts help. Money, smarts, help, leave your details there. Hey, um, Ben, once a year, you and I do a launch of our course. Yes. Um, and we are smack bang in the middle of that launch right now where we offer it as an opportunity. We're taking in enrollments where people can get at a heavily discounted price. We do that once a year. The reason being is we want to get some students in at yep. the beginning of the year and then support them all the way through so we don't take them throughout the year. But also we want to make it affordable and easy for people to get their hands on. So... I want to encourage anyone who's listening to this who wants to uh, understand the evergreen principles of investing in property 
without any fluff, without any spruka stuff, without just the fundamental evergreen principles of how to build a multi-million dollar property portfolio, I want you to go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash start and build. And you'll land on a page. All the details will be there. You'll see the discount. It is a significant discount. And Ben, one of the things that you and I are very proud of is the fact that we want to make education available and affordable for everyone. So the price is very, very reasonable. And as we've tried to serve our community on this podcast for free, we're now at 378 episodes, Ben. And for some people who have long commutes who can actually still binge, they can catch up. But for a lot of people, that's not easy to do. So we are curating all of the key frameworks and principles that you need to know within that course. It's video teaching. It's on demand. You can go back as you like. It never runs out. Um, and you can go and see us. And the way that we've done that is through a format where we've got a camera above a set of butcher's paper and we've got some uh, thick textures and we are going through the concepts in front of you. They evolve. There's all supporting documents. There's case study videos for a thousand, two thousand, three thousand a week. So we want to encourage all of our community to go and um, avail themselves of that this week whilst you can get it cheap, <laughs> whilst you can get it at a heavily discounted price. So as I've been doing for the last couple of weeks, reading out some reviews to give away some free, I'm still going to be doing that today, Ben. So I've got a few here. First one is from Craig Fair, Fair Ben, Fair Barn, Fair Ben. So Craig says this, hi, Ben and Bryce. I found your podcast approximately six months ago and have basically gotten through all of your 376 episodes by playing wow. them in my long commute to work every day and at the gym. That is a good effort, right? In 12 months. That is a good in effort. In six months, sorry. For the past 12 months, I've been looking for my first investment property. Over the journey, I've gotten pretty close on pulling the trigger on a number of properties. This is where the gold is in this feedback, Ben. Mm. These included a holiday rental in North Queensland. Oof. In brackets, we were holidaying and fell in love with Palm Cove. <laughs> Next one, a two-bedroom apartment in Fortitude Valley in Brisbane. Ooh, there's a few of those in Fortitude Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, a new house and land package, first in X suburb in Victoria and then in Y suburb, also in Victoria. So we don't need to call those suburbs out. Um, these are a few of about 10 properties that I said to my wife, this is the one only to keep listening to your podcast and researching to find flaws. She's a little over my researching LOL. I'm happy to say I finally found a property and have had our offer accepted. I'm more confident than ever that our first investment property is a sound choice and I can't thank you both enough for your guidance through my journey. It's only started with my first and I have booked in to chat with you guys about money smarts. Love the banter of footy throughout your episode, especially the love Ben has for my beloved Collingwood. Go Pies. Keep up the awesome work, lads. Go Pies. P.S. How good does Nick Dacos look? I don't oh. want you to comment about how good he looks, Ben. I'm not interested. But I just want to say <laughs> it was touch and go whether I read this one out for that last bit because I was highly encouraged. Free course coming your way. Free <laughs> course coming your way. Thank you, Craig. Yes, love so, Nick Dacos too. I, important. The reason we read, uh, read that out, Ben, is largely because there was almost a couple of um, yeah. false starts on that, which yes. would have set back significant time. So there you go. Free course coming your way, Craig. Let us know. The next one that I'm reading out is from Arlena Mac. I hope they got right. I hope I got that right. Best learning resource, highly recommended. Big fan of the podcast. The con is really worth your while. I've recommended this to my friends and have recently got my partner into it. I'm a young investor who recently got into property, which was sparked by reading Rich Dad Poor Dad, but initially found it really overwhelming since there are so many sprukers around and didn't know what information I could trust. Because of this, I found it really hard to find learning resources that taught me the fundamentals of property investing well. This podcast exceeded my expectations. It, it not only clearly explained the fundamentals of property investing, but every episode I learned even more things, which really helps build my confidence. I've gained so much knowledge from only Ben and Bryce, but of also listening to the highly knowledgeable experts that get brought onto the show. The Money Smarts app is also very useful and a great place to start before diving into property. Really appreciate these guys give so much time helping others not make the classic mistakes in property investing. We're going to give one to you, Arlena. That is our hope with the course that you can curate all that and make it all make sense. And the last Love one it. here, Ben, is from Wilco91. Easy to understand, gold mine of property knowledge. The ease at which these guys convey their considerable knowledge by riffing it together, steel sharpening steel, in brackets, really, Ben? I think it's iron sharpening iron. It's in the sorry. simplest language, it's great. <laughs> you will appreciate the breadth of areas within the property market that is covered and the guidance that is given. There's so much value in these podcasts provided for free that others would charge a small fortune for. That's the underlying point here, Ben. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys, and keep up the great work. Conrad. So Wilco91, Conrad, you are going to get... 
a free copy of our start and build course that is available at thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash start and build for this week at a heavily reduced price. Hey, Ben, we're going to talk about a Facebook Live that you and I did earlier this week. Yep. We are going to put a link in the show notes so that you can go and check it out. And this podcast is the supplementary guide to that Facebook Live because lots of questions came up. We're going to answer them today in our Q&A. We're going to talk about the concepts that were in that Facebook Live. But we went through a fair bit of visuals, didn't we? And it would be best looked at visually, but we're going to make sure that we talk about the main concepts here in audio version so that you can still enjoy a lot of the um, information and content that we shared on that day. So are you ready for this, Ben? I'm ready, mate. I love this stuff. Yeah, all right. Before we get there, Mindset Minute, the smartest things ever said about market timing. Time mm. is the secret source was the um, was the Facebook Live, Ben. Time yep. is the secret source. Why time is the secret source for investing. Property investing. So I thought, well, I'm going to go and find some of the, um, the absolute heavyweights in the world. Um, so Warren Buffett and Peter Lynch. Um, and what do they have to say about timing the market? Here's what Warren Buffett has said. Three things that he said, Ben. Uh, number one, we continue to make more money when snoring than when active. <laughs> All right, fair enough. They, they very rarely change their positions. Yep. No. So there you go, number one. Number two, our stay put behavior reflects our view that the market serves as a relocation center at which money is moved from the active to the patient. Mm. There we go. And then his third one, my favorite time frame is forever. <laughs> that is me for property. Buy and hold for the long term. Okay, what does Peter Lynch have to say about market timing? Ben, number one, I can't recall ever once having seen the name of a market timer on the Forbes annual list of the richest people in the world. If it were truly possible to predict corrections, you'd think somebody would have made billions by doing it. All right, let's buy and hold for the mm, long term there. Uh, uh, yeah. And then this last one from Peter Lynch, far more money has been lost by investors preparing for corrections or trying to anticipate corrections than has been lost in corrections themselves. Let that land. Yeah, it's a ripper. Bit of gold, mate. Yes, mindset setting yes, up for nice. today's Q&A around why time matters in property as a, I guess, a guide. Now, let's, let's set this up. Um, as part of the Facebook Live, we talked yep. about Warren Buffett and... What was really uh, exciting or interesting, if you think about it, was that, and we've said this before on the, on the podcast, Warren Buffett is widely regarded as the most successful investor in the world based on the amount of capital that he started with, which was not so much, and not so much. the position that he finds himself in now, which uh, at 83 was 58 and a half billion, and even more now that he's over 83. But here's the really interesting fact. 99% of Warren Buffett's wealth was earned after his 50th birthday. So if the power of compounding is the eighth wonder of the world, it does make you wonder why anyone would ever consider doing anything other than buying a property and holding it for the long-term, Ben. So um, out, of, out of the mouth of the, the wisest investor in the world, we can't argue with that, can you? No, you can't. Um, now, like anything, he still has... Um, worked a solution of what he calls value investing, which is looking at the fundamentals and looking at the competitive advantage that those businesses have had over the long period of time. Now, we do the same thing here, Bryce. I mean, every time I've been, you know, reflecting on my investment journey over the many, many years that I've been doing investing, including buying shares when I was 16, 17 and beyond, buying my first property, buying multiple properties, having a dabble um, in other investment opportunities. Um, you know, I've, I've invested in um, some uh, long-term cancer research plays in the biotech space. Um, I've invested in crypto. And this is what I've learned, Ross. This is, this is probably one of my more defining messages I have. And that is when I play the percentages, Ross, when I look at the longer term percentages, I have made the vast majority of my money in the boring assets over the long period of time. So anytime I've gone for a dabble um, in the latest internet marketing sensation, um, IPO listed advertising platform, um, best crypto markets, whatever it may be, 
I've, I've tended to sort of either break even or, or take a little bit of a yeah. learning lesson in the red. Um, but when I've played the long game, CSL um, is a good example in my, in my share portfolio. And I've gone in and played. I, I did get out of that for a period of time. I should never have done that. But there you go. That's another lesson. Um, the moonshots are the ones, the distractions where it's, tro- it's all about trying mm-hmm. to get a result quickly and then cash in on that result and rinse and repeat. Uh, you know, versus my boring property investments, Bryce. Yeah. My boring property investments. 10, 10 hours a year in managing the investment properties that we manage and just watching them do the compound yeah. and heavy lifting over time, playing mm. the percentages. Property is an essential need. It's shelter. Mm. Land is finite. There's good land. There's bad land. What can be built on the land? Can it be oversupplied? What are the risks associated with that? Where do people want to live? What are the job opportunities in those areas? What are the propensity of people's incomes to grow over that time? All of those things have stacked the value in my favour. And I'm not talking about trading indexes. I'm talking about buying properties one at a time, Mm. boringly over Mm. a 20-odd year period. And I sit back now and go, Mm. wow, like especially in this last period, the value of that portfolio um, that I have been able to um, grow has been incredibly beneficial for me and my family by playing the long game and thinking on putting the probability in my favor. But Ben, there's a couple of things I want to ask. Well, one in particular, right? Because you get to speak on other people's podcasts. You get quoted in the media. Um, some television programs will ring you up. So I'm hoping that you can provide us with a little scoop here on the, exclusively to the property couch. Um, cause I, right. I don't know where this is going, so but very happy to. <laughs> what you've never actually disclosed on this podcast to anyone on any of the is, is that when you intend to sell those assets that you've purchased, Ben. So if you could just let us know um, if when, when you're planning to sell those properties that you've purchased, because um, I'm sure in the last little boom, they've done really well. If you could just let me know. Um, so people on this podcast can yeah. hear it first. What did, what did Warren say? My favorite time frame <laughs> is forever. I see no reason, Bryce, no reason to be selling assets that they're, they're only just starting mm. their compounding journey now, Bryce. So even though I've held some of them for over 15, mm. some of them even 20 plus years now, they are only really yeah. just starting their true you know, accumulation journey right well, now. Let's talk Bryce. about that, Ben. Let's talk about that. So if we, if we uh, again, one of the concepts that we talked about on the Facebook Live, I'd certainly encourage you to go and check that out. Um, Stiggy will definitely put a link in the show notes for you, um, is why time actually matters. So we had this example, and let's, let's paint a picture, Ben, uh, that people can't, that we need to paint an audio version. We need to start of the visual one. But we, we yep. had a slide up that talked about um, a property that was $600,000, grew at 7% per annum, which is a just under 10-year doubling cycle. Mm-hmm. And, and which will, yep. at the moment, people will go, well, yeah, is that going to happen in the future? Don't worry, we're going to cover that. So let's, let's just, just stay up in, at 30,000 we'll feet with us. We'll, we'll land that plane and talk about, will that happen going forward? But just, just play the maths game with us here. Um, if it goes uh, 600,000, grows at 7%, we went through a really boring table, but a really powerful table. And it said, what will that value be after year one, all the way through to year 10? What will it be in year 11, all the way through to year 20? And what will it be in year 21, right the way down to year 30, right? And so a $600,000 property with 7% growth is uh, going to be worth, Ben, 642000 after year one. Assuming it's got this linear growth, we know yep. property isn't linear, but let's just stay with the maths experiment with us here. So it's six hundred and forty-two, yeah, six hundred and forty-two thousand dollars. Then, if we hang on to it for a decade, after ten years, that six hundred thousand dollar property, if it doubled in value every ten years, it'd be worth one point two. But this is a, a, at seven percent; it's just over ten years of double. So after ten years, it's one point one eight million. So in ten years, it's almost created six hundred thousand. In fact, it's made about five hundred eighty thousand dollars. That's pretty good. If you think about someone who's had um, a lifetime of contributing to super, 
and putting that away. Sometimes people don't have that much in super or they might have about the same, right? So no. one property, 10 years, almost another 600,000. But then the journey went on. Year 11, right through to year 20. So at the end of year 20, again, we're trying to convey this in an audio format. It was worth 2.3 million. So 600 had gone from 2.3, to 2 which meant that the growth in that decade was another 1.1 million. And then from year 21 all the way to year 30, Ben, this is usually the bit that boggles people's minds. And they go, oh, this is unrealistic. Yeah. This is not going to happen. I've seen this in many books and many tables, but this is where it becomes a work of fiction, right? But let's just humor ourselves here, Ben. Um, year 21, the value was 2.4. At the end of year 30, it's worth 4.5 million. Started at 600, and then it goes to 4.5 million after 30 years. So hang in there, folks. We're going to bring this. We're going to bring this home for you. So, in the first decade, year one to ten, year zero to ten, really, it grew in value by five hundred and eighty thousand dollars. In the second decade, it grew in value by one point one four million dollars, and in the third decade, it grew by two point two four million. So, what's the point of the story? Well. If we take the 30-year journey of owning that one $600,000 property, listen to this. In the first decade, you would have got 14% of the overall return. In the second decade, you would have got 29% of the overall return. But to Ben's point <laughs> that the journey's only just begun on the properties and why he's not selling them, and as I'm not selling my properties, is because the third decade, Ben, that 2.24 million represents 57% of the overall 30-year growth. So it begs the question, why wouldn't you hang around for that decade, Ben? <laughs> why wouldn't you? Especially when, even though maybe your percentage of value to rent is going down as a, you know, as a gross rental yield, you are still, you know, what sort of rent would you get on a $4 million property? You're going to be getting several thousand dollars a week in rent. So, it, 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 you know, firstly, when you think about it logically, Bryce, what happens is you cover your debt first. So, you know, you think about, you know, a negatively geared property, you're running it at a loss. Over time, it turns neutrally geared and then it turns positively geared. Then you pay your debt down, own it, and then you effectively live off the, the passive income. I mean, and if you rinse on repeat on two or three of those properties over a three three decades, and you hold on to them for uh, further decades, it is a game changer, Bryce. It's an absolute game changer. And what I like about this story, right? And and again, check out the the Facebook Live because. There's two awesome case studies in there where we, we drill into mm. actual properties um, where we talk to that story. So, um, you know, we'll, we might get to that. But Bryce, one of my key messages here mm. is you bank the dollars, right? So you don't bank the percentages. So we also know that, you know, just in last year, we saw some markets, Melbourne do 15%, other markets, Sydney, say did 27% or whatever it was, it did. Like, so it doesn't perfectly run up a flagpole in a lineal way just, just build, right? And in some cases, you're going to see that it's not always north sailing. We're going to come back down and have some corrections and some, some adjustments in those valuations. So we're not saying that this is true for all. There might be some people listening to this podcast here, yeah, I bought a property back in 2008 in a high-rise apartment and I can't get what I paid for it back then. That is true. There are caveats on the type of asset you buy and that's why we spent the number of episodes that we've talked about in terms of fundamentally understanding demand and supply, understanding buyer interest and buyer behavior, understanding land to asset ratio, understanding all those critical elements that will, again, here I go, Bryce, increase your probability mm. of success. No guarantees here, but I was saying before, my moonshots, the ones where I'm trying to you know, uh, turn a crypto return into a big winner versus the boring, stable stuff that I do says to me that I've made more out of doing the boring stuff that I've factored in on the high probability 
of success rather than the low probability of that long shot, that moonshot. Now, who knows? Maybe one day one of the moonshots will land. But the point being is um, if I kind of just stuck to my knitting and kept building out those moonshots, which I did, fortunately I did most of those things, and that's why I haven't got too many horror property stories. The one I have got for you, Bryce, is the one I bought in 1991, I think it was, in Fundura, or Bundura for those people who live in Melbourne. Um, and I paid $120,000 for that property. And the last update we did, I said it was, you know, sort of worth about eight or 900. They're selling for a million dollars now, these properties in Fundura, which is 26 kilometers from the CBD of Melbourne. So there's more and more areas that are beginning to that million dollar range in Melbourne as well. And so I just needed to be sensible. What did I do? I got bad advice. I didn't know really what I was doing back then. I had the knowledge of decades upon decades of learning and, and I'm playing the percentages. And so with that view, I'm buying properties in high demand areas um, where there's low scarcity of land, mature assets or character assets, which give me a little bit of an X factor in terms of higher quality, more, more owner occupier appeal as we call it. And the rest is history. So what are you saying, Ben, that you're not going to sell these properties? Is that, is that what I'm hearing you saying? I am. I have no intention. In fact, I might even put them into trust, Bryce, just so the kids can't sell them as well. <laughs> Very good. So, yeah, no, I um, I had a, um, uh, you know, I can't remember how long ago it was that I said this on the podcast, but my, my very original mentor, property mentor back in 1998 said to me, never, ever sell. And I've, I, I, so that was my opening mantra. And I've, I've adjusted it to hardly mm. ever sell because there is a, uh, one or two um, times when you would. But generally speaking, that mantra is something that is stuck in my mind and, it, uh, and my kids will um, benefit from the portfolio that Andrew and I have been building. So, but I'm now entering the third decade, Ben, which is exciting, which you've just flagged as well. So um, it is. And, and one it of the is. properties that I had was on the Gold Coast. It wasn't performing great for a while, Ben, but uh, has started to ramp. And it's been interesting. The, the back end of the tail on that particular property has been quite good. Whereas if I'd, I'd lost... Um, uh, if I'd, I'd been discouraged earlier on, I wouldn't have been able to enjoy that. So, so folks, we, we have this view that time does matter, right? Mm. Hopefully that is insightful for you to understand that um, if we go back to founding principles on this podcast, you, when do you buy a property? Uh, when your cash flow allows, you buy the right property, correctly finance it, and you hold it for the long term. That is not a platitude. That is actually something that is that is based in mathematics. It's based in precedent. It's based in... Um, the the eighth wonder of the world around compounding. So we got some questions that came as a result of us doing that Facebook Live, Ben, and we didn't get a chance to cover them off. So we're going to cover them off today with the podcast audience here. So the first one was from Julian. The question was pros versus cons. In investing $600,000 in an investment grade property versus two times 300 investment grade properties, what is the better strategy uh, if looking to source BA. So clearly there's one saying buy 600, one buying two at 300, Ben. So yeah. um, get your opening remarks and then we'll talk about one of the replies that we got from one of the Facebook listeners as well. Yeah, I can I can definitely see an argument for both, right? I've, I've, I've had internal discussions and, you know, when you've got a team the size of ours, there's a lot of um, thought processes on um, being able to separate that into two, uh, great $300,000 um, properties. The question from Julian is the challenging one around investment grade. Mm. Um, in, in some respects, I, you know, I gain, I, I'll, I'll just give you my personal example. I have not entertained buying um, in low socio demographic areas, even though the percentages and the numbers might work on paper. Because when I think about my risk profile or how much interest I wanna take in managing those properties, and what I mean by that is the quality of the tenant that I might experience, I'm not sure I necessarily wanna have that headache. And that's very common in terms of when we, uh, you know, when I'm dealing out this type of advice to other investors 
um, who are paying for my advice, I basically say, look, where do you buy a $300,000 property where there's lots of scarcity of land um, and there's a real uplift in terms of the next generation of investment that's going into that area? Like how long is that going to take to have the land fully utilised? How long is it going to take for gentrification to occur in that area um, when really gentrification usually occurs from the big cities outwards? And so whilst I might also get to argue that um, I get a higher yield, so my overall return might be a little bit better, I take great comfort, absolutely great comfort. And I'll give you my two examples. Um, a house I bought in Alexandria in Sydney in 2001, that I paid $395,000 for, so it was relative to the time. Um, now that's probably pushing one six plus um, and the one in Flemington that I bought at 395,000, I think in 2007, um, that's now pushing, pushing probably one, two, uh, one, three on a good, uh, you know, good sort of competitive market. Now, what happened with those two properties is I've got a long-term, you know, capital gain appreciation in excess of 8% on those comfortably. Um, I've had them rented to really good young professional tenants who looked after the property. I've had very little issues. Um, in, in one case over the sort of what the, I've been renting out a couple of those, one property for 15 odd years. I had one case where the boyfriend who, who wasn't on the title, um, you know, ripped the front uh, security door off. That was probably the worst event that I've ever had in that property. Um, and one of the other properties had a flooding event um, where it's got a rooftop terrace, so it, it, um, it had water coming into the kitchen. Now, they are the two biggest things that I've had to deal with over basically 20 years of renting out those two properties. And my rental income has been solid, in great foundation. Those things spit off a huge amount of cash flow um, in terms of that. Now, does that say on paper that the $300,000 investment where I may have got a better a percentage return could have done better for me? Um, probably, but just be mindful that um, I wanted to be a hands-off passive investor um, for those people who are looking to look at what they would consider investment grade areas. Um, there's going to be a little bit more work that needs to be done there. And look, we buy for, for people in that price range. So it's no illusion to them. Um, and certainly for those who are trying to break into the property market, we did that podcast at the end of last year, I think November of last year, where we did say, if I'm young and I'm energetic and I can make some of those early mistakes or I can uh, have a little bit more of a calculated risk as part of that because I've got time to recover, um, that is true. But I'll leave you with this important message and that is that obviously those properties that I've bought are inner city areas and I feel very confident of the history of what will happen in Sydney and the history of what will happen in Melbourne and the livability of those two cities and the knowledge centres that they are and the incomes that will come out of those centres over the next you know, 30, 40, 50 years. And if those centres don't do well, I do worry more for the markets that are in the outer areas because why would I, why would I pay um, 600, or let's call it now, why would I pay 1.4 million in an outer city area if I can buy closer in at 1.4 million? You just would buy in the better areas and more established areas where you've got the benefit of lifestyle and appeal. So I've always thought about it from, I bank the dollars, I don't bank the percentages. Um, and as my portfolio grows, um, I know that the next decade is going to be my most fruitful decade, every decade that I hold those assets. Nice one, Ben. You touched on it. Um, the, the, there's a filter when you're buying a property that you run through. You've got to check its growth, uh, its yield, its vacancy rate, and its quality of tenant. You talked about that because this has been uh, a debate for as long as I've been involved in property, you know, approaching 20 yep. plus years now, right? So should I buy um, two at half the price or one at the full price? And when, like you say, at 300000 that's that's probably starting to really scratch it now because of a couple of things that you talked about. But the, the other question is, well, would I buy two 600s or one 1.2? Because um, then it starts to become a little yeah. bit more of a, oh, okay, that's uh, because you can still find some stuff around the country at 600 
with uh, pretty good yep. yields that would perform higher yields than the 1.2, but the 1.2 is probably going to be closer in, but the, the yield is going to be lower. So it becomes this, this balancing act of risk profile. What are you looking for? What's the time horizon? What's the cash flow needs that I have? But yeah, when you're talking about $300,000 properties, there are properties you can buy for $300,000, but um, they are really starting to um, um, be a, a thing of the past where only in people's yeah. history uh, for 300,000 rather than being able to get that now. You know, when you'll know that they're investment grade, Bryce, mm -hmm. about 10 to 15 years later. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, Julian, if you can find investment grade at 300,000 and investment grade at 600,000 and you execute on either or, or, mate, you're halfway home, right? This is about playing the percentages. I think one of the biggest challenges we've got, and we heard from, one of our people who we gave away a free course for Bryce was actually getting in the game. Mm -hmm. Half of the work that we try and do to people is build the confidence up to execute. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. We all want to be, we all want to perfect investing. Like if you ask me the, the hypothetical question, do you want to be the best investor and that will give you a higher return? Of course you do. Absolutely you do. But I'm not going to be waiting three or four years before I finally find that perfect investment. Because I don't, I just, it's, it might be out there, but I, I'm guaranteeing you that I probably won't pick it. Um, so I'd prefer to be in the market and um, taking that longer term play with the confidence that I have that, that that land scarcity and that land to asset ratio will play in my favor as all of the other people who are getting their inheritances and their money and, and redeveloping all those beautiful properties in Alexandria and redeveloping all those beautiful properties in, in Flemington and Ascot. Like, I'm just like, go for it, crew, because you're making my land worth more. Mm -hmm. Keep going, mm -hmm. keep going, because I just need a really tidy, clean asset um, and watch it grow. Because the more investments that those people make in those areas, the more they put my land value up. And that's what's really growing um, when it comes to the long-term returns that you're getting. Uh, Mark Brown was a response to that one. So here's another opinion from someone else independent of us, Ben. But um, I'd much rather a 600 property over two 300 properties. My expenses on a 350 house are not much cheaper than my 650 house. I'd rather retire with three properties than 10 if the total value was the same. Less rates, insurance, property managers, tenant requests, et cetera, et cetera. Mark makes a really good point. It's, it's actually it the value of the portfolio that's important, not the number of properties that you have. Um, yep. because if you talk about what you said before, well, it's the percentages that are going to do the lifting, but then it's the dollars that you're banking. So um, uh, good feedback there from Mark. So thank you. Yeah, you can make a case either way. And there is plenty of people who do and they'll back it up with their numbers, you know, similar to me sort of saying that, yeah, I bank dollars and not percentages I can show. I can make a case for that story as well. Um, so it's really about what you feel comfortable with, but we're sort of saying you need to go in with your eyes wide open in terms of what you get for 300. Um, what type of tenant you get for 300. Um, and if you do that um, and you, you're confident in the demand supply and all of those other elements over the medium to longer term, um, I'm just happy that you actually put your skin in the game and had a go. Very good. Hey, this one's from Brody. Brody is the name, so uh, the Facebook name. When the, property, uh, when the property cycle is at the peak of the cycle and properties are generally overpriced, is there another investment type area that you recommend? And you kind of covered this a little bit in terms about keeping your mm. eye off the prize and going for your moonshots. But um, what I would say to that too is that um, we are reaching um, uh, definitely at a point where we've reached peak rate of growth. Um, and in some areas, we still see that there's some growth left in this market. But um, you don't have to go too far back on to our podcast catalog, back catalog to, to see that we've said that in some cases, some of the growth that's been made through the pandemic will be given back. Um, yep. And last week we talked about it's a balance sheet issue, not a cash flow issue. Because if you have any fluctuations in balance sheet, if you're not A, in the position that you're selling or B, that you're in the immediate position where you've got to refinance to, uh, to buy another one, it's kind of just market noise. And so for me, uh, my main investment has always been property and I will continue to do that going forward. But the, the important thing is it, the opportunity that's, that's about to come is if, if the market does um, take away um, a little bit of sentiment, interest rate talks, people you know, not seeing um, properties rise 10 grand every weekend, all that sort of stuff, they start to pull out. That's a, you see that as an opportunity, Ben, that you can double down on getting um, access to the better assets with le less competition. Because if your base thesis is the concept that we're talking about today, 
that you want to hang around for the third decade, then that that stuff doesn't necessarily matter. So you stay uh, true to the asset that you think is going to perform well for you. Clearly, our bias is is well known, but there is an opportunity um, coming if you think that properties are overpriced and you do think that some of the market will give some back at some stage that you can get in and and make sure you're accumulating the better assets over time. So if you if you think about it from that perspective, um, why, why would you necessarily deviate to a another investment type if you if you don't know a lot about it? Yeah, you know, I think that there are times when going into a particular capital city market might be a higher risk because of the run that it's had. Um, so when I'm thinking about um, Brody Brody's question here, you know, he talks about areas it recommend. We are coming into that market. So if we, if you look at some of the data that we've produced through SRP, we talk about uh, capital cities fluctuating every decade in terms of who's on top and which capital cities perform the best. That just indicates to you that over a, a, a an interim short period, which is 10 years, you are getting you'll get some fluctuations in that, right? That's and that's volatility. Yeah, that's true. And 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 so, you, you know, that's where we say markets within markets and looking in those other markets where there's potential for, um, for good buying, but momentum on the right side where it's, it's building its, um, its property clock story. So it's bottomed out and we're now sort of in that upward movement. And I mean, Perth would good, be a good example of that after, the, after they open up next month, um, it's going to be interesting to see how that market really does move because there's a lot of pent up demand there. There's very, very uh, small amounts of vacancy. So it'd be interesting to see how many people are pour into that market and the pressure it puts on that market. So that's an example of where we would say um, good buying opportunities in that lower end of the market. Whereas, as, a, as I've openly said, I don't understand Hobart's price at the moment. I think that's completely overvalued. Um, and I'll either be proven right or wrong over the next 12 to 24 months um, in terms of where there's been over exuberance. So they are examples of where I would say um, that. I would always say when I look at the long-term returns of Melbourne and Sydney markets, I'd love you to have a property in Melbourne or Sydney mm -hmm. um, as part of playing the probability story here. Because if you do so, I think you're putting yourself in really good shape. If you can't afford those markets, I, you know, we've talked about investing within one hour commute in the other big um, sort of regional centres that are really satellite cities of the main uh, mega cities, they would also serve you well, I suspect, over the medium to long term as well. But just make sure you're looking at the cycle and just how much of a run it's had um, to sort of find your next opportunity. So in, to your question, Brody, it was another investment type or an area that recommends. So we there is diversity being borderless through the area that are recommending. We don't get specific on um, areas to recommend, although you've got a couple of hints there. Um, but investment type, we would still suggest that um, that if property is your preferred vehicle, that you stick to it, despite the fact that you think that might be at the peak of the cycle, or even if you think there's some overpriced, don't pay for the overpriced. Do your research to make sure that you can get something that is um, fair fair market value, but um, stick within the asset class that you're comfortable with and that you know will perform long term. Hey, this one's from Kim uh, Santiago Metaverde. Thanks for your help on our portfolio. We are now just playing the waiting game. We can see the growth in our properties already. So that's great. Playing playing for, for the long term. Sit back, watch them grow. Hey, this one's from Pete. Uh, Pete Fairley. Hey, fellas. Pete from Adelaide Hills here. I'm a carpenter just starting up my property portfolio. Thoughts on if I should look closer to home within half an hour so I can do maintenance renovations myself or would something further away with a little more growth and set and forget it then? Uh, decision is, Peter, are you going to be a passive investor or are you going to be an active investor? If you're going to be an active investor, if you can find a tired old property in a really nice area and you can buy it well, i.e. for land to asset ratio where the land is greater than 60% or even 70% in some cases, do it, add your magic because you are going to do that at a cost-effective way compared to the rest of us because you're not paying for labour, which is the biggest expense when you're renovating. Um, so it, it really is about your time allocation and what you can do, because I have no doubt that through uh, simplistic renovations and cosmetic renovations and tidy-ups where you have that skill set, um, there's money to be made there, but that's not investment returns. That's just a good return on your time. 
Um, and if that gets you underway and you can then move to a more set and forget model, I think you've got a nice formula, Pete. Um, you're handy, Peter, uh, or Pete. So that's that's pretty um, helpful when you can create a bit of sweat equity. But um, for me, the key in your question is um, you said, so I can do maintenance slash renovations myself. I actually think it's a, a maintenance versus renovations question because yep. the, the answer to just because you're handy, whether or not you need to do the maintenance is um, is a moot point because your property manager will tap you into someone who's going to help you with the maintenance anyway. So you wouldn't want to buy a property just so you can do the maintenance, but then you've purchased in an area that's not performing. So maintenance is no, no looking further away for more growth if, if it offered a better opportunity, but renovations, that's the key, that's the key kicker because if you can, if you can see opportunity and the fact that you are handy and the fact that you can do some of the work yourself and the fact that you can create some equity and you said you're starting up your property, you're starting up your property portfolio. So that might give you the, the boost in equity that you need that you can leverage against to get the second one, which could be further away for set and forget. So for me, the key part of your question is maintenance versus renovations. No, don't go close to home for maintenance, but do consider going close to home, all things being considered for renovations, because I think there's an opportunity for you to add some value there because of uh, because of your skill set. Hey, uh, this one's from Doug Slater, Ben. Love your work, gents. Is it, and this is in response to the conversation we had in the Facebook Live regarding the $600,000 property doing 7%. Love your work, gents. Is it realistic to assume that property values could continue to rise 7% on average over the long term? I know past performance demonstrate, demonstrates this, but looking to the future, can wages continue to grow to enable this? Can wages continue to grow, Ben? There is a fair bit for us to uh, unpack on this one. There's a heap, Bryce, and I'm just, I thought I'd jump onto our research platform and just bring up a couple of, of longer term numbers. So I'm looking at sort of, this is Melbourne's median house price over 31 years and 10 months. Um, we're seeing a compounding growth return of 6.07. So you can see there that over that time period, so that's where property prices have gone from, um, what are we talking about there? Uh, median 810,000 is the data that I'm looking at, which is a 12 months return. So that's uh, growth since the start um, of you know, 686,000 over that time, um, the overall percentage return of 553% um, and the 12 month growth period here on our data is showing 12.34. So that just gives you some idea from 1990. If we actually go back to value a general data, um, back to 1974, I can now tell you a more interesting story. Over 40 years and 11 months, Bryce, the compounding return based on value or general data has been 7.81. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so that's potentially saying that that growth rate is slowing. And I don't disagree that um, when you look at a broader market, um, you are going to see some of those growth rates, growth rates Ooh, slow. No, I like what you did there. Uh, I like what I did there too. Mm. Um, but yeah, there is no doubt as, you know, seeing properties worth 4 million, um, you know, when you're looking at long-term projections from 600,000 as a starting point, it does feel unrealistic. Um, and I would buy into that story around um, certain markets where that may not necessarily uh, occur because the demand and the ability to buy in those areas just won't be supported by the fundamentals. But it's pretty easy to also bring a case together. And we talked a little bit of this on, on the Facebook Live. There's some data, and I would love to know if anyone's seen any data. We probably should reach out to some of our data people as well. $70 trillion of wealth is going to be passed down from baby boomers to um, Gen X and Gen Ys in America over the next 20 years, $70 trillion. Now, Australia is one of the most wealthiest countries in the world, and we have a huge amount of baby boomers that are going to pass on an enormous amount of money. So I'm going to start this, Bryce, and you can bring this point home. So imagine if I did have an inheritance between half a million and a million or $2 million that's coming to me. Um, and I already own a million or a $1.5 million property that I own $500,000 on. And all of a sudden, I've got another million dollars to invest. 
I've got a choice of what I do with that money. I can potentially upgrade the car, buy the caravan, do whatever, or I could potentially look to upgrade into a one point five, sorry, two point five million dollar house with a five hundred thousand dollar mortgage price. Mm. So, all of a sudden, what I like about what we talk about is um, again playing the percentages um, that inner city land area comes at a premium, no matter what which city you live in around the world in Western developed nations where you can own land. That is no true, no truer than here in Australia either. So. I'm banking on that part of the story combined with what we are also seeing is that skilled labour is earning wage increases far more consistently and almost double the size of unskilled labour. So once again, I bring the story back to what drives demand is people's ability to be able to afford the debt um, and be in the game when you know when the property comes up for sale, creating that demand and pushing values higher. So that wealth transfer is going to play an enormous role, as is um, double household incomes and their ability to afford that. But I don't believe that's going to be fairly distributed um, right across um, the property market. So I think um, I will continue to play safe bets in going into big capital city or at least top 50 population centres around Australia and picking the eyes out of those in established areas um, where we think that, you know, that story can play out in a more consistent way. Nicely said. I, I, I think that if you you've got to think about the profile of the suburbs, so if you go to a new housing estate where someone's buying the house, they've got a high LVR, they've had a first homeowner's grant um, to buy the house and they are uh, pulling every single resource that they've got together just to actually settle and buy the property. It's fair to say a lot of people in the same area have the same profile. So that particular suburb would have generally a high LVR versus if you go to a more established suburb where someone who wants to buy into that suburb for the first time, say it was someone who was getting into that market and they went and got an 80 to 90% LVR, Ben, they would have a very high leverage on that purchase but a bunch of other people in the suburb wouldn't have the same leverage. Some of them would have the house fully paid off. Some of them would have a 10% LVR and some of them would have a range of LVRs, 40, 50, 60, right up to 90. So the, the, this, this comes up so regularly that it's important that we labor the point where someone says, hey, wages aren't growing enough for us to sustain an increase in prices. And it's like, well, We've, we've been teaching our community that, that income is a very good leading indicator for us to understand um, where the better suburbs are, where the people are moving, um, therefore where the pressure on the pricing is going to go. But don't mistake the fact that some people do not buy housing purely through leveraging the whole time. Some people may pay cash for a house. Some people may pay the example that you talked about before where they've got an inheritance. So that's important to remember because... 60 minutes of current affair, they'll always do a story. They will always quote that the, the income is uh, not high enough for the, for the debt for the suburb. But please do not forget what CoreLogic tells us that the LVR for the entire residential property market across this country fluctuates anywhere between 25 and 30%. That's the LVR across the market, which means most of the, the properties have equity in the market well in excess of the debt. In isolation, one person might have a lot of debt. In isolation, in a particular suburb that we described, a lot of people across the profile might have a lot of debt. But please do not fall for the, um, for the myth that just because wages growth doesn't grow doesn't mean that there's no future increase uh, available for the properties. Now, Ben did um, eloquently say that we don't think the rising tide is going to lift all ships going forward. That is true. We feel that to be the case. But that doesn't mean that you can't um, find investment grade suburbs to find these properties that will continue to get um, some of these growths going forward, which underlies, which underpins the whole thing that we're talking about today is if you hold it long enough, um, you'll let the th second and the third decade do most of the heavy lifting for you. That's not going to be derailed by this, this um, narrative that says incomes aren't growing. So therefore that is now a work of fiction. It won't actually go forward in the future. So it's important that we, understand that we've got to be specific on asset selection, but there is still a bunch of reasons why properties can and will continue to go up in certain suburbs going forward. Because as soon as we smash the myth that every homeowner has 80 to 90% worth of LVR on their purchase, the quicker we can better understand why that might be the case 
and why we can actually still pick the eyes out of the market and get these growth rates going into the future. Hey, Bryce, I've got a quick correction. The data that I shared with you for the 40 years and 11 months, anyone who was doing the quick math would work out that that's not 1974 data, that's 1980 data. So 7.81% over Melbourne based on core logic data um, over that time period. So again, it's going to be challenged. And we, we also need to make sure that we, we accommodate the political persuasion and the risk around what may happen in terms of um, housing affordability and those types of things as well. So this is a game where I come back to, um, you know, I, I don't see in Australia, I hope I don't see in Australia where you are capped at how many properties you can own. But I do see um, potential future pressure on being able to own more than 10 investment properties and getting negative gearing on your 11th and 12th and 13th property. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's reasonable, but I also understand that that's difficult if you're buying, you know, these 300,000 or $150,000 assets in the middle of whoop whoop. Um, so it might be a, it might be a dollar value that you'll be capped out of. Cause I do, I do see that um, the, the political challenge will be around um, the prosecution of these greedy property investors. Um, and that's why, again, we, we want to make sure that we're advocating for the accommodation that we're, that we're putting in, pr in front of people. So I know that there's going to be, at the end of this year, there's going to be huge demand around rents being so expensive and no free accommodation. Well, that's a product of governments stopping investors, mum and dads, from buying investment properties for these people to rent. So... So, you know, if you're going to make it more difficult like the Queensland government is in terms of their, their, their rent theft that's going on up there at the moment around land tax, you are going to get less investors up there and you're going to get people arriving there and saying, I'm paying through the nose for my rent. That's because you didn't allow us investors in there. And when you do, when there you take all of our revenue. Mm. So ultimately, there's, you know, we can find better returns elsewhere and we, we take our investment dollars elsewhere. Mm. So, you know, that's... That's the sad reality of, of the unintended consequences of government interference in an open market. Good question, Doug. Hopefully that's helped the listeners listening to your question as well. Last one here is from Emmanuel Bully Kamaj. Do you guys have a list of recommended brokers? I mean, Western Sydney, if that helps. Ben, we, um, we don't promote our business on this podcast. And there are a bunch of people who listen to our podcast who uh, great brokers who aren't as affiliated with us. So that, that's the baseline. But I kind of think it's worth um, pointing out that um, we have an award-winning uh, mortgage broking business as mm -hmm. part of ours, where we're particularly proud of the strategies. Um, Super proud of them. That they set up on behalf of property investors. And the fact that they understand property investors doing finance for property investors for the vast majority of our, our team are property investors. Um, I think it's worth pointing out here that uh, to Emmanuel's question, um, we are an investment savvy mortgage broker. We are um, able to help clients in every state and territory in this country. Um, so in well, it, was, it was interesting to see in, in National Australia Bank's results, Bryce, that they were saying that since the pandemic, 40% of their applications done direct through their branch channel has been done from people in their homes. So people aren't coming into the branches anymore mm. because they don't need to. Mm. Um, people now understand that they could have their broker um, in another city to them mm -hmm. uh, because everything is digitised, there's digital signatures, all of that process can work. And, and so, yes, you know, we've, we're very fortunate and also very proud of the number of clients that we help right across Australia and overseas for that matter. We have a huge amount of expatriates that reach out to us and we, we're delighted in the solutions that we come up uh, come up with for them as well. Um, so that just goes to show you that your, your, not only can your buyer's agent be borderless in a way in terms of where you buy, but also now your, your broker, uh, your tax accountant, your, uh, your property investment advisor can be in any state or territory as long as they have access to that data um, and can provide you know, the, that useful knowledge that, that people are looking for and, and the problem solving skills of, of what a good uh, investment savvy mortgage broker should have. So whether you find that in your own backyard or whether you shop around, I encourage you to, to look, you know, more broadly around the businesses that have really great 
customer satisfaction scores and um, and to doing what they said they're doing. I mean, we we you know we had the fortunate um, numbers of uh, one and a half, sorry, one point one billion dollars worth of submissions uh, in the last calendar year, bro. So we you know that that, that that's people voting with um, you know l- looking at us to say, well, let's give them a go. Um, and in some cases we're we're really busy, and so people have to be patient. And in other cases, we can we can take new clients on straight away. So it's just best to reach out to us and have a free initial chat if you if you're interested. It's a it's a good reflection point that you make there, Ben. Only rewind sort of three four years ago where you think, all right, I've got to go and get in the car, drive it across town, find somewhere to park, go upstairs, um, yeah. chat to your chat to your advisor, go back downstairs, and whereas. Now with bring all my paperwork, put it all in a folder. <laughs> Whereas now, like you say, with with the advent of online storage devices, you've got um, Pexa that will do the settlement electronically. You've got DocuSign where you can sign um, contracts uh, electronically. I mean, even when even our team, we used to have to ring up the client and say, "Hey, listen, where's your nearest office works?" Okay, um, and we would do the work to say, hey, "This is your nearest office works." So what you need to do is you need to go and print it off, <laughs> sign the contract, scan it, stay at the office works, so you can get that over to us so that we can send it off to the agent now we just ask them to have their smartphone and get ready to put a signature on their smartphone and we can turn the contract around in an absolute hurry so then you've got DocuSign you've got PEXA you've got the 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 banks um uh what you just described and then you you can just go on the landscape has changed enormously where enormously um the only the only consideration you've got now in this country is time zone that's it that's it because if you're, you can, if you, yep. and and the good brokers will accommodate you, whether it's face to face or whether it's uh, remote yep. or you know via Zoom or in our case Teams or whatever you use. Yeah, so it's all about times. I think. Good question, Emmanuel. Thanks for the opportunity um, to our community for letting we 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 very rarely do that, but um, just thought it'd be worth highlighting that um, that is something we do. Hey, we've we've covered a fair bit of ground, Ben. Thanks to Julian, we Mark, have. Brody, Huge. Kim, Pete, Doug and emmanuel for your question so um hopefully that's been helpful uh we're, we're definitely going to put a link make it nice and easy for you to go and have a look at the facebook you can see the visuals as ben said we did two case studies to actually mm, land the right. plane on some of these concepts that we've been talking about today about holding for the decade so we found some properties where we've actually seen a track record of holding for 40 years ben 40 years 40 years mate 40 years so you can actually go and have a look at that so ivis will definitely put that in the link hey my life hack today ben this will come as a surprise to you but i wholeheartedly passionately believe in residential property as a vehicle for creating uh, lifestyle design um, Mm -hmm. via passive income so if i believe that to be true and what we talked about today to be true then i think the best thing that people could do is go to um, get a copy of our start and build course um, yep. If they go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash start and build for this week only, you will see it's at a heavily reduced price. And I encourage you to get that because what we've done is we've curated the insights of not only 379 episodes of the podcast, 20 plus years of our own investing journeys, um, uh, all of the collective experience of our team, um, which is now we've got over a hundred people, part of our, our group of companies, Ben. So there is a lot of intellectual horsepower that we get access to, plus our own experience that we then poured into that course. So I want to encourage you to go to that, get access to it. It's got a full money back guarantee, Ben. Go and do the course, watch it, watch all the 12 hours of video teaching. If you say it's rubbish, send us an email, we'll give you your money back straight away. That's how much we believe in it. And that's how much we believe in the price point yep. that we've positioned this at, Ben. So um, that is my life hack today. What is making property news? Mate, what's making property news? I promised this last week we ran out of time, but I've, I've been watching what some of the economists have been saying. Now, Bryce, I don't need to go too far back when the pandemic broke and not only the economists, but the, the naysayers and the people who have predicted the crashes that, uh, you know, our good friend Peter talked about in, his, uh, in the quote that you said, Peter Lynch. Um, they, they, there's, there's, they're going to come. There's going to be more of them. But I just want to go through some of the predictions because most of them were saying 20 to 30% falls, if you remember, mm-hmm. or Do. really extreme cases, 40% price falls. None of that turned. In fact, we turned around the other corner and here we are with property prices growing by 20 to 30%. Um, our good mate, Shane Oliver, we've got a lot of time for Shane, but he's he's a little bit more pessimistic, pessimistic than optimistic. So he's moved his forecast from 5% growth down to 3%. ANZ, on the other hand, Bryce, have actually raised their forecast from 6% to 8%. 
Westpac this year, only 2%. NAB, 3%. CBA, 7 So there's a real variety in terms of that. So what I want for you as, a, as someone who gets to digest this news cycle um, is to think about that and think about, visualise this for me. Grab that piece of paper and basically screw it up in your hand. That's it. That's it. Screw it up and mentally throw it in the trash can. That's it. Did you get it in in the one go or did you have to pick it up and put it back in? <laughs> Just get it into that trash can because it's absolute dribble. Um, and I'm, I mean that in the nicest respect to our economists, but what I am saying, and they have to provide these because obviously they've got to do their forecasting and their treasuries and work out where the demand's going to come from, et cetera. So I understand we all have to do forecasting, but the reality is there's no such thing as the Australian property market. 3% growth, 29% growth, whatever that means, it's all irrelevant. What is relevant is you look at the markets within markets and you go to the fundamentals because you're buying one property at a time. So when you can find that property that meets your brief in terms of the returns you're trying to get, um, where it interferes with your life or doesn't interfere with your life, you want to be passive or active or whatever you're doing, just look at the fundamentals, get into the research and then start looking at the data and then saying to yourself, okay, this one looks to have low vacancy. It looks to have high scarcity. Um, it looks to have some good levels of demand drivers that are here not only for today, but into the next 10, 20, 30 years as population grows and we get through into the end of the roaring 20s. And if all of those things stack up, execute. If you can afford it, buy. Um, and sit back and wait for the first decade, wait for the second decade. And someone who's now sitting in my third decade of seeing those returns come, know that your best returns are ahead of you mm -hmm. um, when you get into that phase. So that's the luxury I have of being able to do this for the past 24 to 25 years now mm. in terms of where I sit. So um, that's what I'm saying because the noise is going to come. Interest rates are going to go up. Mm. As much as my bum points to the ground, interest rates are going to go up. And so once you understand that, prepare for it. Understand that the noise will be strong in the mainstream media, but play the long game, people. That's what this message is today. Why time matters. It matters because... If you hang around and stay in it for the long term, material things will happen. Mm. Good things will happen and lifestyle by design will be achieved. There you go, Bryce. That's what's making property news. I feel like I need to stand up and clap it. Uh, well said. There's uh, definitely some some wisdom in that. But uh, I think the key takeaway from today, Ben, um, is to quote you, you bank the dollars, not the percentages. Um, so I think that's important. So let's play the long game, folks. Um, let us know on socials if that was helpful for you. Um, go and check out the course. We'd love for you to be um, part of our intake for this year for our Start and Build course, mate, until next week. Knowledge is empowering, Bryce, but again, only if you act. So people, if you're in a position, get yourself organised and take the leap of faith. There you go, folks. You heard it here first. See you next week. Hey guys, Bryce here again. Just want to catch you before you go and let you know, if you're new to our community, there are a lot of episodes to catch up on, but it's really important that you start from the very beginning at episode number one. Because episode one through to 20 share all of the foundational pillars and frameworks that you need to know to get the best out of listening to this podcast. So I'd recommend that you start there. And the little tip is to maybe start on one and a half speed. Now, for those of you that are time poor and don't have time to go back from the beginning, don't worry, we've got you covered as well because we've created a binge guide that goes through all of the details and makes it easy for you to read and get up to speed very, very quickly. So if you go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash fast track, you will be able to download that binge guide and you will be up to speed in no time. And whilst you're there, I've got a few extra goodies for you because we have our top five frameworks that you'll learn on this podcast, as well as the Make Money Simple Again ebook which will help you with the foundations of basic money management so you'll have everything you need to succeed in building your own lifestyle design and getting the best out of this podcast. Now, just a reminder that anything that we cover on this podcast is not considered financial advice. We certainly recommend that you get your unique circumstances looked at by your individual advisor and everything we talk about is just general in nature. To the property couch dot com dot au forward slash fast track 
and you can go and get all those goodies and catch up right away.